Hi, this is Nick, Stop Smoking Specialist. Thanks for being here. No matter how it is that you've come to be on this uh, presentation, I want to thank you for your time. I do value it. And regardless of how you found it, I want to make this presentation really valuable to you. I have no doubt that no matter how you choose to stop smoking, the information in this uh, presentation is really going to help you. Um, I've devoted a big chunk of my life to helping people stop smoking. Um, I used to be a smoker myself, um, and it's a real passion of mine. I, it's, uh, I, I think it's uh, horrible how our government makes millions of dollars off the backs of dead and dying smokers, and I've seen what it's done to family members of mine. And so, you know, I, I really um, put a lot of information into this presentation. Some of my colleagues think I'm crazy for giving away this information for free, but you know what? I wanna help you stop smoking. So I wanted to just introduce myself right here and now just here so to prove I'm a real live person and all. Um, so sit back, relax, take it in, try to watch it all in full if you can. Um, it is gonna be recorded, so if I go a little quick, it's okay, you can go back to it any time, remember where you're up to and just um, pick up where you where you left off. So without any further ado, I'm now just gonna share my screen and we're gonna get into this presentation. Okay, so, so in this presentation, very quickly, what we're gonna cover, I'm gonna go through four steps to help you stop smoking permanently. Now that word permanently is important because, you know, maybe you've tried a few things in the past and maybe you have quit for, um, you know, a few weeks or a few months or maybe even a few years, but it takes a very special type of mindset to quit permanently. And there's a few things in this presentation that I'm gonna share with you to help you quit long-term, to make your next attempt really be it. And then I'm gonna share with you a new way to stop smoking. I wanna share with you a new method, a way that really gets to the real root cause of why you're smoking. Because unless you address the root cause of why you're smoking, you're only ever really addressing the um, symptoms, not the actual cause. So I'll give you um, a little bit more of a background uh, about me and, and how I and why I've come to be here, just so we can uh, get to know each other a little bit more. Um, I've been in the personal development industry for a very long time now. Um, as a teenager, I met someone who got me really interested in personal development. And I kind of followed my nose and read a few books and then decided to do psychology at university. So, and I really loved that. I really loved exploring the um, architecture of the mind and why we do what we do and all that kind of thing. And I went on to do a fourth year, my postgraduate degree, because I really enjoyed doing it. And I really wanted to um, pursue a career in this line of work. Um, uh, so I went on and did my fourth year and really loved it. But, you know, as a lot of people do when they finish uni, I did go traveling after that. Um, I traveled a lot of the world. I was gone for three years. I lived in Canada for one year, lived in the UK for two, and that's when I did most of, or pretty much all the travel you can see here. Um, I went to India, uh, Thailand, there I'm with the tiger, love tigers, um, Greek islands, uh, Japan, Uganda, and the gorillas, and Jordan as well. And while I was traveling, I did kind of sales, telesales, customer service kind of work because finding work in therapy was a little hard, even though I did do some volunteer jobs. When I came back, I got into sales and corporate sales and recruitment, but um, I hit a real um, a fulfillment wall. I wasn't really being fulfilled with um, that kind of work. I was making good money, but really was lacking fulfillment and was surrounded by quite a lot of egos in that environment too. So I did a bit of a 180, went back to my psychology roots and started my psychology internship, which is a two year program to become a registered psychologist. But only six months away from finishing that, I came across hypnotherapy and hypnosis and neuro-linguistic programming. And I just loved the fact that it could get someone results in such a fast period of time, in one or two sessions, I realized I could get people results that some people are going to see psychologists for 
for years. So I actually left psychology, I left that form of um, therapy, which has its place, but I just wanted to get people results faster, quicker. So I, I did my hypnosis certification, NLP, and I haven't looked back. And since then, um, for the last eight years, I've been a hypnotherapist and I've helped a lot of people um, stop smoking. I've helped people with weight loss, food addictions, anxiety, and that kind of thing. So that's kind of me. But now let's look at smoking, shall we? Now, we already know that smoking is bad for us, right? You already know that. I'm not going to insult your intelligence. But maybe you didn't know a hard-hitting fact that it's actually the most preventable cause of death in the world. Like, it's, it's pretty huge. A person dies every six seconds because of smoking. And research has shown that it cuts a person's life short by an average of 14 years. I mean, that is a lot of time. I mean, if you've got children that are that age or older, imagine missing 14 years of their life. I mean, it's pretty huge, you know, and it actually kills 50% of its users. So half the people that are smoking, if they smoke to the day they die, is a 50% chance that they'll die as a direct cause of smoking. And we all know that usually dying of smoking is not a quick thing. It's usually pretty slow, painful, and you're not the only one going through it. So is everyone who loves and cares for you. So, I mean, these are some of the reasons why I'm so passionate about helping people quit. And now, look, I mean, if money is one of your reasons for quitting, I mean, take a look at this. You might be interested. I mean, if you've been smoking for about 20 years, like many of my clients have, uh, since 84, looking at this information I found on the New South Wales Retailers Association, Depending on how many you smoke a day, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, or 30, this is pretty much the amount of money. This takes into account the price rise of cigarettes since 1984. And I mean, if you're smoking a pack a day like most of my clients, up till today, you will have spent anywhere between 92 to $115,000. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty huge, really. I mean, I just think it's 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 amazing that smokers are paying the tobacco companies and the government to slowly be poisoned by them. I mean, you know, it's it's ridiculous. And I'm here to help people gain back freedom and control from that. So let's have a look at these four steps, shall we? So four steps to stop smoking permanently. These are the four steps that we're going to go through right here and now. So the first step is to create compelling commitment because i mean you you probably know already that unless you're really committed to stop smoking unless you're committed to the non-smoking um life chances are you're not going to quit long term it's only going to be for a short time because i read a quote that was really cool about commitment and it was so relevant for smokers i once read Commitment is staying loyal to what you said you were going to do long after the mood you set it in has left you. I'll say that again. Commitment is staying loyal to what you said you were going to do long after the mood you set it in has left you. And isn't that really true with quitting and smoking? You've probably quit in the past because something got you really committed for the moment, really, you know, you were in a mood. You know what I mean? Like, oh my God, they've gone up again. That's it. Forget it. I'm quitting. But then that mood that you said that slowly fades away. A stress happens. Something happens at work. An argument with your partner. You're out socializing, having a few drinks. And then oh, that mood has faded. And you go, oh, just a path. One won't hurt. And then bang, you're smoking again. So there's a real kind of secret to getting really compelling commitment and that's exactly what you need when it comes to stop smoking so i'm going to share with you some some things you can do to get some really compelling commitment because like i said unless you've got that first nothing's going to work for you you're going to rely on the aid to do all the work and hope that there's some easy way out that takes away any effort on your part but there's always effort that needs to be put in i know i used to smoke myself and i know that at some point i just had to put in the effort so that's the first thing we're going to go through Second thing I'm going to discuss is the difference between habit and addiction. 
So there is a very big difference between the two. And we're just going to kind of just have a look and just explore, well, what what is what is this smoking thing really? Like, is it really a drug addiction or is it a habit or a bit of both? And we're just going to explore that. Then I'm going to go through mindful habit breaking. So I'm going to share with you some um, techniques, uh, some simple things you can do to start breaking the habit of smoking. And then I'm also going to show you step number four to quitting permanently is some emotional management techniques, some things you can do to manage those emotions that sometimes brings people to smoking. Sure, you might be smoking many times out of no emotion at all. You know, maybe you're smoking so often that you don't even allow yourself to get a craving or an urge. Maybe stress isn't a big trigger for you. However, I'm willing to bet that maybe if you've quit a few times in the past and you've gone a little while without smoking, maybe it is one of those things that did bring you back to cigarettes, an emotional moment, a stress, an argument, um, that kind of thing. So I think it's really important to address um, some techniques and some stress management tools and techniques. And I'm going to share with you, share them with you right here and now in, in this presentation. So, all right, number one, creating compelling commitment. So how can we get really committed apart from just waiting for a time when you feel something on your lungs or you've got a dreaded diagnosis? I mean, some people, unfortunately, will only get really committed when something drastic happens, you know. But look, my aim is to get you feeling committed compelling um, commitment before something like that happens. You know, you don't want to get to that point to, to get commitment. So one simple thing you can do is get really clear on your reasons. Now, look, I don't mean just having some reasons in your head, you know, like, oh, yeah, I want to, yeah, yeah, of course it's for health and breathing and la, la, la. I mean, really get committed and write them down. Like get a piece of paper out, write it on the top. I am going to stop smoking on, on a particular date maybe, um, that you want to stop smoking for the following reasons. And write down, once you get on a roll, you'll find it easy to come up with 20, 30, 40, or even 50 reasons. You know, write everything down. Um, I want to breathe better, have more stamina and endurance so I can do more exercise and more exercise will mean I look better. I might lose a few kilos. And when that happens, like make a story of it, you know. That's what I mean by detailed, multi-layered, throw some emotion in it. When it's detailed, you're writing the story of your new non-smoking life. Really throw some emotion into it. I mean, you really got to connect with what it is you're actually doing here. You're not just stopping smoking. You're extending your life. You know what I mean? This deserves some attention. It deserves respect. It deserves some preparation. You, you wouldn't expect to run a marathon without any preparation. You wouldn't just come across a marathon one day, see them at the starting line and go, oh, gee, you know, yeah, there's a marathon. Yeah, it's a nice day. I'll run that. If you haven't done any preparation, you're really going to rely on your willpower to get you to the finish line. But if you've done preparation, if you've prepared your body with some training, you don't have to rely on willpower as much because your body is supporting you through that process, through that run. And you know what? It's no different here. It's no different with stopping smoking. You need to mentally train and prepare yourself for a date because if you don't do that and you just wake up like maybe you have on the 1st of January and go, oh, New Year's resolution, I'm just going to stop. You haven't done any preparation. Well, look, you know, I'm not saying it can't happen, but chances are you won't go the distance, you know. So really get your reasons extremely clear. Write them in the notes section on your mobile phone, perhaps. You know, we've all got smartphones these days in the notes section. Get real with all your reasons, you know. What will happen if that happens, you know. That's an easy way to make your list longer. When you've got your list, you can double it by going back to the first thing you wrote and wrote and write, well, if that happened, what would be the natural follow-on from that? So if you wrote better health, for instance, what would happen if you had better health? Oh, well, I'd breathe easier. What would happen if that happened? I would do more exercise. What would happen if that happened? I would um, uh, look better. What would happen if that happened? I would, my self-esteem would go up. What would happen if I'd be more confident? What would that mean if that happened? Oh, I'd meet someone. I'd be a better partner, a parent, or 
whatever. You know what I mean? I mean, seriously, uh, if anyone um, can't come up with 50 reasons to stop smoking, then, I mean, you know, don't bother, <laughs> really. You know, it really is pretty easy to come up with a lot of reasons or, when you think about it. And, I mean, part of that process as well is make the benefits and the consequences as real as possible. You know, I mean, if what you're writing down mean something to you, then it will be really real. I mean, get some emotion into your reasons. It's emotion that really fuels your stop smoking process. What is emotion? It's energy in motion. It's a movement. It's a fuel of behavior. Emotion fuels behavior. And when you've got emotion, it makes you do the things you know you need to do. So really involving emotion into your reasons uh, is, is one of the best things you can do. And also, I mean, just ask yourself, why do I smoke? You know, what are the reasons, you know? Um, list all the things that you think smoking gives to you. And we're going to touch on that in a moment. And that can really help you make this transition as well. So, I mean, moving on from that. So what's keeping you smoking? You know, just kind of stop for a moment and have a think about that. You know, what what is it that's keeping you smoking? Are you fearful? Like, is fear holding you back? You know, fear of failure kind of thing. I often hear that one, you know. But really, fear is your biggest traitor. I mean, have you ever done anything in the past where you're a bit fearful, but then you actually did it? And then you look back and realize, gee, you know what? Like, it wasn't as bad as I thought kind of thing. You know, I mean, don't let that hold you back. I mean, you've got to keep your eye on the prize and what it's going to mean to you to, to kick this habit once and for all. So, you know, some of the things that people will will mention when when um, I ask them, well, what's keeping you smoking is some of these things. So stress, you know, oh, stress keeps me smoking. It, it relaxes me. Maybe people will say, well, it gives me a time out. You know, I'm a mum with a lot of kids and or I've got a really stressful job. I've got so much going on. It gives me a reason um, to take a break. It's me time, you know. Um, people will say, oh, the social aspect of it, you know, I've got some friends I smoke with and we do it together and that kind of thing. Um, some people will say, I like the feeling of it. I like that hit, you know. Some people say, it's my little friend, you know, it's been there for so long. It's there for me through good times and bad. Some people will say they actually like the taste. But you know what? We can go through each one of these single things and just poke holes in it because if you're still attached when it comes time for you to quit to any of these reasons, if there is still an attachment and a, and a fantasy of these things still existing in your life as a smoker, well, then it's going to make quitting a little bit harder. So the more you can poke holes and really analyze and put the reasons why you think you're smoking under a microscope and really pull it apart, then you're going to feel less attached to smoking and it's going to feel easier to let it go. For instance, Stress, it relaxes me. Well, ask yourself, do I honestly think I can't relax in another way? Is cigarettes the only way I could relax? Admittedly, it is the easy, lazy option to relax and unwind. Oh, well, why should I have to learn new stress management techniques? I know I can just pull out a smoke, go outside and smoke it. Sure, you could do that, but <laughs> chances are you're watching this because you know that, that that pattern and that behavior needs to stop. Otherwise, it's going to lead to something you don't want. So does it relax me, really? I mean, stress, we know that nicotine is a stimulant. It actually elevates your body's level of stress. It elevates your heart rate, your blood pressure, um, stimulates your nervous system, increases your heart rate. So it's really not relaxing you. It's just the mental connection you've got between relaxing moments and a cigarette. But the cigarette itself, in terms of what it's doing to your body, is actually elevating your, your level of stress. Time out, me time, break. Once again, do you honestly think you can't get that without cigarettes? Of course you can. There are people, there are non millions of non-smokers out there that get exactly that. And there's no reason why you can't either. You just got to commit to it. The social aspect of it, well, really, is it social these days? One of the reasons most people come to me is because they're finding it antisocial. It's like, oh, gee, you know, I'm the only one at a party that has to disappear, go down the alley, around the corner, and I can't smoke here, I can't smoke there. There's more and more restrictions coming in. You know, you can't smoke in this area, in that area. Now they're bringing out you can't smoke within four metres of a restaurant. I mean, 
how they're going to monitor that, I don't know. I mean, imagine a, uh, an inspector draw, oh, you look, you're four metres next, uh, anyway. But my point is, it's really getting antisocial, and you probably know that. Um, you like the feeling of it, the hit. What is that? That's actually poisons running through your veins. You actually like the feeling of this poison affecting your body, ruining your body and, and poisoning you. I mean, really, really, you like that feeling? You know, I mean, sometimes I say to people, it's my little friend. I mean, really, does a friend really poison you? I mean, would you pay a, fr quote, friend to poison you? I mean, it might be there for you because you go to it during emotional moments, maybe. So anything you do or anything that's a go-to for a person when they might be feeling a certain feeling, it's normal that it can act as a kind of support. And when you think about it, isn't that why a lot of smokers um, will um, use cigarettes as a crutch? Because when you're feeling something, it's your go-to. So it is normal and natural that one can kind of have an association of, oh, it's my little friend. But at the end of the day, you know that this relationship is a toxic relationship. <laughs> really, just like a, per a person, when you break up from someone and person you've met, you know, you might have heard that, that term, toxic relationship with people. Well, there's no better example of a toxic relationship than this one right here. You know, when it comes to a breakup, you know that you've got a particular future that you really want. Let's say a future of a non-smoker, being healthy, living longer. But you know you're not going to get that if you continue this relationship. So you break up. And it's like a breakup, isn't it? You know, it really is. You know, a a leaving cigarettes behind can definitely be like a breakup. But you know what? If you broke up from a person who was toxic, what do all your friends and support networks do? They get you focused on what your life is going to be like because of that breakup. So when you stop smoking, you got to do the same. You know, if a few days or a week or a month after you're in a moment and you're contemplating a smoke and feeling like, you know, something's missing and oh, sure, something will be missing. It'll be that toxic relationship you didn't want, you know. You've got to keep your eye on where you're headed in your future because you made that empowering decision to leave that toxic relationship so it's really important important to do that and the taste well you know i look to be honest i haven't met many people that say they would enjoy the taste i mean really it's it, it actually destroys taste and you probably know that your sense of smell and your sense of taste comes back so quickly once you quit you know things will just um things will just elevate on a completely new level. Some people will just say, I enjoy it. You know, they don't really know why, they can't give real reasons. Maybe you can relate, I enjoy it. But here's a really interesting thing I'd like to do right now. Just, just um, if you're one of those people that still might say, oh, I still enjoy it, I'd like you to notice what you feel, what you notice when you see this. Have a look at that. You might have seen this um, three-year-old Filipino baby that's actually a chain smoker. Now, I'm sure right now there's something in you that is saying that is so wrong. I was almost going to put a video clip of this little guy. Um, you know, he, he's quite big. Um, he's quite heavy. And he smokes. He's a chain smoker. Now, there's something in you that knows this is extremely wrong. You would never encourage a child, your child maybe, any child, to smoke. But why would you do it then? Why would you not encourage a child to smoke? Why is it that this disgusts you? Why is it that, that this looks so wrong? Because you know deep down that it's a poisonous thing to do, that it ends life, that it kills people. But why would you do it to yourself? You know, don't you deserve love and respect? Doesn't your own body deserve love, respect, you know? So just something to really think about. So now let's move on to point number two, which is the difference between habit versus drug addiction. Now, this is a really imperative distinction to make here and now. Why? Because what sounds more achievable? I'm going to break a habit. I'm going to get off this addictive drug. I mean, it sounds a lot more doable when you say to yourself, I'm going to break a habit. I'm going to stop this habit rather than I'm a drug addict, you know. 
I mean, really, the pharmaceutical companies have invested millions and millions of dollars into a story which a lot of smokers um, have come to believe, which is the only reason you're smoking is because you're, you're a drug addict. So if we can give your body this drug in a new way, rather than puffing on that cigarette, you'll quit. However, if that's true, then why aren't nicotine replacement therapies 100% effective? Why is that? Well, if this is true, Mr. Drug Company, Mr. Pharmaceutical, if, if, if why I'm smoking is because of this drug, well, why is it that when I slap a patch on my arm and I'm being fed nicotine, and mind you, mate, probably a lot more than you'd ever get from smoking, why is it that I still want a smoke? I still want a cigarette. Maybe you're a kind of person that's peeled it off and smoked anyway, or I've just had a cigarette. Or maybe, you know, um, you've thrown a patch on in the morning and then later on in the day you realise, oh, oh, gee, my patch is gone. Oh, it's fallen off. Oh, my God, I need a cigarette. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> that Maybe that shows smoking is more of a psychological thing than a biological thing, but more about that in a minute, you know. So, I mean, there's got to be more to it. Now, I'm not saying, obviously, nicotine is not playing a role in smoking and keeping you smoking. Of course it is. But what I'm trying to get you to just consider and give some thought to is there's a heck of a lot more going on and there's a heck of a lot more that needs to be considered when it comes time for you to stop smoking. It's not just about feeding your body more nicotine. Chances are you've already done that. You've already gone there. It's old, been there, done that i've used all those replacement therapies and nothing's changed so it's time to think of a new way and it's time for a new approach and i hope this this presentation can be part of your new approach also the fact that secondhand smokers don't feel the need to rush out and start smoking think about that for a moment if the chemicals in smoke are truly addictive to the human body then anyone breathing that smoke in for long enough would eventually feel the huge urges, cravings and desires to go out and smoke, wouldn't they? Because they've got the same chemicals in their body, obviously to a lesser degree, but they've still got those that smoke in their body and those chemicals. Back in the day when you used to be able to smoke in bars, restaurants, clubs, even offices, I mean, hey, it wasn't that long ago that you could be puffing away, sitting right at your desk in a high rise, you know, even in hospitals. I mean, really, it's not that long ago. Now, if smoking was truly addictive, uh, biologically addictive, and the nicotine was addictive, then anyone breathing in that smoke for long enough would eventually feel the need to, oh, my God, I need to smoke. But no one does. No one starts smoking because they got huge cravings because of just breathing it in time and time again, you know. But here's the interesting thing. A lot of people have contracted secondhand smoking related illnesses, but have never smoked a cigarette in their life. They've been around smokers. Maybe their partner used to smoke in bed. I've heard that before. You know, oh, my grandmother, my mother got a smoking related illness because granddad or dad used to smoke in bed um, and she just kept breathing it in and she got lung cancer or something. So, you know, there's a huge difference there. The chemicals are definitely bad for your body and can kill you, whether you're a smoker or not. But just having the smoke in your body doesn't force you and create cravings for a cigarette. What's the difference? It's the psychology that the smoker has that the non-smoker doesn't have. So very, very big distinction there. Also, let's consider the real deal, shall we? Real drug addiction withdrawals are absolutely horrible. I've worked with drug addicts. I was a, uh, a manager, a volunteer manager of a homeless shelter in the inner city of Sydney for four years. And I worked at a crisis accommodation where I saw real drug addicts and what they looked like, what they felt like, what they would go through. I mean, seriously, a true drug addiction, um, like heroin, cocaine, amphetamines, the body eventually gets so biologically dependent on those drugs that that person needs that drug in their body just to feel normal. I mean, any heroin addict will tell you after a certain point, it's not really about the high anymore. It's just about keeping away those horrible physical feelings they would get if they stopped. So their body is definitely addicted. And that's why they do require replacement therapies. For instance, a heroin addict needs methadone because methadone tricks the body into making it think it's got that drug. And then the person can wean down bit by bit while they work on their social and psychological structures as well, because that's a huge transition to make. Maybe you know people that have gone through that kind of thing. It's, it's really full on. You know, and their withdrawals 
are horrible. You know, you get a heroin addict. If, you, if you've seen Train Spotting, that movie, I mean, if you notice any heroin addict or you see them when they're withdrawing, they're on the ground shaking, vomiting, their colour in their face is horrible. I mean, they can't sleep for more than an hour. Their physical cravings will wake them up repeatedly through the night. I mean, tell me what smoker goes through that when they stop smoking? Not Nothing like that. You might get moody, irritable, cranky, passive aggressive that kind of stuff but you don't you don't physically lose it you don't you, you can still drive a car send an email make a phone call you know it's, it's really minimal when you look at true drug addiction and also look at pregnant women and newborn babies if you've got a heroin um uh, ad addicted mother or woman who's addicted to heroin cocaine or amphetamines whether they're pregnant or not they won't stop Whereas you probably know many women, maybe you yourself, when you fell pregnant or when you heard of someone falling pregnant, boom, they just quit, just like that. And they'll tell you it was easy, too, really easy. Whereas no heroin addict has ever quit just because, oh, I'm pregnant, oh, I better stop injecting heroin in my arm. No. And when those true drug addicted women have their babies, their babies are already addicted to that drug on their birth. They're a mess. Whereas even if women smoke cigarettes right up to the day they give birth, their baby is relatively okay. I mean, yeah, sure, there's a risk factor for size, um, colour, uh, that kind of thing, but it's a risk factor. It's not a guarantee. 20, 30, 40 years ago when it wasn't as so horrible to smoke, many women were smoking. Many women gave birth to babies who who, who smoked. Maybe your mum smoked when, when she was pregnant with you, you know. I mean, and you turned out okay. And babies are generally fine. But when a woman is really addicted to a drug, you know, uh, that baby has no chance. It's not a risk factor. It's a guarantee. Now, look, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that smoking is not addictive. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that smoking is mainly a psychological dependency, not a physical one. And there are so many examples of how smoking is more in the mind than the body. Here's one perfect example for you. What about when people go and fly? and they take a flight for hours. I mean, maybe you yourself notice that. Maybe when you're outside the airport waiting to take your flight, you're waiting to walk in, <laughs> you're puffing away like crazy, but as soon as you walk in that airport, something in your mind goes, click, that's it, I can't smoke. It's just not possible. And you're fine, you deal with the flight, you're okay. But as soon as a plane starts to pull up, and, you know, the captain says, oh, we'll be arriving in 20 minutes. Uh, all of a sudden, your mind clicks from it's not possible to, oh, yeah, I can have one soon. And you start climbing the walls. <laughs> now, isn't that interesting? A true drug addiction does not work in that way. A heroin addict doesn't walk into a, an airport and a flight going, oh, I can't use. There's nowhere to shoot up. So, you know what? I'm fine. I'm all right. And then all of a sudden, when they can shoot up, oh, gee, I need my heroin. It doesn't work that way. This shows what this is, is simple proof of the power of your mind over your body, mind and body connection. When you walk into that airport, you have a conviction of thought, which is, I cannot smoke. It's just not possible. So what happens? Your brain produces the signature biochemical chemistry that corresponds to that type of thinking. We know from depression studies and research that thinking affects brain chemistry, which in turn affects the way you feel. And then you're, you're eventually feeling what you're thinking. It's a bit of a loop. It's a bit of a cycle. So when you've got a thought of, I can't smoke, I'm not, I just, it's not possible. Your brain sends that chemistry to the cells of your body and boom, you feel fine. But as soon as your mind changes for, to, oh, I can smoke soon, your brain starts producing that kind of chemistry and then boom, it feeds it to your cells and all of a sudden, oh my God, I need to smoke kind of thing. Don't you think that's interesting? Very much so. So what is smoking then really? What is it more? It is a habit. A habit which you do, which is basically the repetition of an action. How do you define a habit? That's exactly what it is. It's an action that you do again and again and again and again and again and again and again, <laughs> right? So, I mean, just look at that line, that finger action. I mean, sometimes part of the struggle in quitting is just doing something with your fingers. You're so used to having that there as a little comfort and, you know, you do it again and again and Think about it. 
you know, if you're smoking, say, like most of my clients, 20, 25 cigarettes a day, and it takes roughly 10 draws to finish a cigarette, how many times are you bringing your fingers to your lips? Just think about it. You know, 10 draws a cigarette uh, one, in one cigarette, 200 to 250 or even 300 times a day, you're doing that action, fingers to lips, fingers to lips, fingers to lips. So, of course, you know, the drug companies will tell you, oh, when you stop smoking and you get moody, irritable, irritable and cranky and all that, it's because you're withdrawing from a drug. You're a drug addict. But hello, think about it. If you were doing an action with your hands so often for 20 years and you try to stop that all of a sudden, cold turkey, of course, you're going to get a little uh, irritable, a little, a little. Oh, what am I going to do with my hands? A bit uh, kind of thing, right? So you need to address that, obviously, you know. But there's also another thing that makes people um, experience that moodiness, irritability, and that kind of thing. I'll, I'll share that with you in a little bit. So at this point, hopefully, unless you already were sold on it before, by this point, you're probably in an agreement that, yeah, look, yeah, there's something happening on biological level. Sure, nicotine um, has an effect, but you know what? It is mostly a psychological thing and it's just this habit that I need to break. So let's move on to step number three, mindful habit breaking. Now, some of these things you might have heard, they might not rock your world, you know, but if you do, even if you learn one or two things here that you could do differently in your next attempt, then, you know, it'll have been worth it. So, all right, here's a couple of things you can do to mindfully start breaking this habit of smoking. Make a list of the ones you think you really need. I can guarantee that if you're having 10, 15, 20, 25 or up a day, I bet that out of all those cigarettes you're having in a day, there might only be four or five that you really say you, quote, enjoy um, or that you, quote, need. So why don't you get really clear on those ones and try to aim in the start to get down to just those ones. All the others, you're just having unconsciously. You probably don't really even need them, but you're just having them out of routine and habit. So just start getting mindful of those ones and they're the easy ones to eliminate first. So ration yourself, you know. Um, instead of bringing a pack with you out, you know, in the beginning of your day, try to ration yourself instead of, I mean, you can appreciate, obviously, if you've got a, a packet in arm's reach in your purse, in your pocket, isn't it going to be easy to just whip one out and spark up when really you probably didn't need that smoke? So bring a separate container. If you have, you know, you're starting out, you're a packet a day smoker, bring 15 in a separate pack and go, you know what, I'm just going to have those ones. And then 10 and then maybe five. Right, today I've got these five in this little steel canister. That's it. I'm just going to have those ones. So, and obviously after you, when you're rationing yourself, you're going to have to delay your smoke. So just delaying them, just, oh, okay, let me just do this before. Oh, okay, I could kind of go on right now, but let me do this first. Just pushing it back can really be something that um, it just starts getting you used to doing certain activities and being in certain situations without a cigarette there between your fingers. Um, and start doing different things. I mean, you know, when instead of, you know, rushing out in your break and sparking up, okay, what can I do instead? Is there an errand I can go run? Is there something else? Is there someone I can call? This Chew gum. I mean, that's another one, you know. Um, uh, brushing your teeth, chewing gum, mouthwash. These are things like sometimes if you've got a nice, clean, fresh um um, mouth, you know, sometimes the urge to smoke can be a lot less, you know, like keeping yourself clean and smelling good. I mean, that's one thing that can kind of help. Now, like I said, it, one of doing just one of these things and nothing else probably isn't going to rock your world. But if you do all of these things a little bit in conjunction with one another, you're really giving yourself a fighting chance. I'm sure you'd agree. Um, know your triggers. Obviously, plan for them. Just plan ahead and go, right, okay, that moment I know is a bit tough. What can I do instead? Give it a little bit of thought. Once again, it's about that preparation, you know. Keeping your eye on the prize and what quitting could mean for you long term, it's really worth just planning ahead a little bit, you know. It's it's worth that bit of effort. Um, and, you know, like we are saying before, hand distractions, maybe, um, you know, um, with a pen or something in your hand, something to play with, a stress ball even. I've heard people using a stress ball. Um, you know, those um, kind of jelly balls um, to play with. One guy I knew quit just by cutting a piece of... Um, 
uh, it's like, it was like a, a piece of wood that was exactly the roundness, diameter, radius of a cigarette and about the size of a cigarette. And he just had that in his, in his hands, you know, and he just kind of played with that. Um, you could call someone, that's a good distraction as well. And here's one thing you can try, which I bet you probably haven't tried before. When you're trying to address an urge, try um, having ice water, actual ice cubes and chew on the ice nice and slowly drink that ice water nice sip it nice and slowly and chew on the ice and you might be surprised how it actually helps um reduce your cravings and look here's a few extra little things that you can do as well i mean some we touched on but look here's another th here's a few things you can do you can go to a place where it just isn't possible to smoke I mean, you know, uh, like I mentioned earlier, when you jump on a plane, you know it's not possible. So it helps you actually deal with it. Maybe you can do the same. Go to a restaurant, go to a movie, go to go to things where you know it's it's hard to smoke, you know. Also drink plenty of water or fruit juice. And here I'm going to share with you a really powerful reason why it's really important from the day you quit to have natural sugars, fruit, juice, and honey. I guarantee you didn't know this about smoking. Did you know that cigarettes are up to 20% sugar? That's right, sugar. Wow, really? Yeah, exactly. I found that on Wikipedia. Now, unless you've worked in the tobacco industry or you've made cigarettes yourself, I guarantee you didn't know that. And the reason why it's got sugar in it is because when they harvest tobacco from the fields, the raw t um, the raw flavour of tobacco is horrible, disgusting, bitter. So to make it taste better and, quote, smoother, all those marketing words they used to use, they soak the leaves in massive vats of sugar water and they soak those leaves and they add all these artificial flavourings and flavouring agents. That's why if you had five brands lined up in front of you and you took a Pepsi challenge and you were blindfolded, I bet you could pick which brand was yours just based on the flavour. Why? Because it's got different flavors and additives than to than other brands. And that's why when you understand, wow, there's a lot of sugar in cigarettes, especially those menthol ones. If you're smoking menthol, they're very, very high in sugar. That's why people's teeth, smokers' teeth get a bit rotten and horrible because we know sugar's no good for your teeth. It's also why when you stop smoking all of a sudden, it's partly why you get moody, irritable, cranky, passive, and the need to eat something. If you ask any diabetic how they feel when they know their blood sugars have dropped, what will they tell you? Moody, irritable, passive, you might know a diabetic. And when they get a bit off in their blood sugars, you know about it, right? So the easy thing to do to address that is have natural sugars, fruit juice, honey, um, anything, you know, pieces of fruit through the day. Um, it's really going to stabilize your blood sugars. Try to avoid artificial sugars, fruit uh, like um, soft drinks, energy drinks, chocolates, lollies, desserts, sweets, because your body knows exactly what it needs and what it doesn't. Our body is a beautiful machine. It knows exactly what to hang on to and what to get rid of really quick. So when you have artificial sugar, it uses it really fast and then gets rid of it really fast. That's why you get a sugar rush and then a crash. That's why when your kids or kids, you notice kids when they have sugar, blah, 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 they're bouncing off the wall and then they crash, right? So, hello, we're the same. Adults are just kids in bigger bodies, you know. So, you know, when we have um, artificial sugar, you know, it gives us a bit of a crash and that's why around mid-afternoon, hard time of the day for a lot of people to have energy. So what do we do? We grab our next stimulant coffee, chocolate, cigarette to get us through the afternoon. And then at the end of the day, bleh, we're just dead, crashed out, right? So have um, plenty of natural um, sugars and drink plenty of water. Water is very, very key um, because one of the reasons, the main reason smokers get any illness or disease is because of circulation. Cigarettes and the chemicals in cigarettes prevent your cells from absorbing water. Your cells and our body, as you probably know, is mostly water. So um, when your cells are prevented from absorbing water, as the chemicals in cigarettes do, it limits your circulation. The nutrients from your food and beverages do not get around your body. And these days, the catchphrase is, you are what you absorb. It used to be, you are what you eat. But now we're realizing that unless we facilitate our cells to absorb all that great food and drink that we're having, then it's pointless. We need to absorb nutrients, not just eat them. 
you know. So that's why, you know, juicing, lemon detox diet, that was all really good stuff to help absorption of, um, of um, good food and, and healthy eating. Also, one thing I can definitely um, recommend you do when from the moment you stop, which will really help you quit, is um, eating raw macadamias mixed with good organic licorice. Why? Because nuts are naturally high in a oil that is very good for the brain. If you put um, nuts, particularly macadamias, in a brown paper bag, you'll see that it actually stains the bag because it's very oily. This oil is fantastic for the brain. Um, all nuts are, but macadamias in particular. When you mix it with licorice, it creates almost like a kind of nicotine withdrawing. Um, it, it fights the nicotine withdrawals. Licorice is a really good natural way to suppress um, sugar cravings as well. So mix those two things up. I know some people don't really like licorice. I'm not a huge fan of it myself. But when you mix it with macadamias, it is a little bit more palatable. Um, keep it on your desk. You know, same with water. If you are sitting at a desk um, through the day, you're in a place where you're pretty sedentary, um, then keep water around you. Water is one of those things, out of sight, out of mind, you know. Um, and you can just nibble on those raw macadamias and licorice through the day as well. So, you know, the other things you can see here, eat well, obviously, exercise, which is really good for mind, body and spirit as well. Go outside, that middle box there, you know. I mean, getting some sun. You know, this uh, sun they found in uh, so much research with depression and stuff that getting outside can make a real difference, you know. Taking some deep breaths there. Chewing sugar-free gum. Sugar-free, very important for the reason I just mentioned. So it keeps your mouth a bit active and busy. Listening to music, read, call or text a friend. You know, these are things you can do as well to, um, you know, just start getting used to the new habit, the new routine. So... All right, so point number four, let's move on. So emotional management techniques. And like I said earlier, I honestly believe that unless a smoker really learns some new ways of dealing with emotions and stress and those feelings, then you're really kind of behind the eight ball uh, right at the start. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so let's have a look at some, shall we? So breathing, obviously, you know, when things hit the fan and you're stressed and you're about to rush out and, you know, light up a smoke because you're feeling what you're feeling, really just take some deep breaths. Go outside, do the same thing. You see, this is what's relaxing smokers. Um, they think it's the cigarette calming them down, but it really isn't. When you think about it, what do you do in that moment? You go, oh, that's it, I'm going outside. You leave the environment, you physically get up, you walk outside, you're having a moment to yourself and you're taking deep breaths, right? That's what's actually calming you down. It's not the cigarette because we know the cigarette is um, uh, elevating your stress, but you've got a mental connection that when you do that thing, you calm down. So your mind can override what your body's doing. But you can get those same great feelings by taking some deep breaths. What I've got there, five seconds in, five seconds out. So just take a moment, go outside, sit under a tree, sit in a park, close your eyes and count. One, two, three, four, five in. One, two, three, four, five out. Just count it in your mind. If you did five seconds in, five seconds out, you took 10 breaths like that, I guarantee you will feel calmer. Five seconds in, five seconds out, really deep, slow breath. It's a type of yogic breathing, um, which is very powerful for the body. I mean, we know that the heart rate slows down when you send it more oxygen. When you send your heart more oxygen, it puts more oxygen into your blood. When there's more oxygen in your blood, it moves around your body better. When it moves around your body, it feeds your muscles muscles, your nervous system, everything with nutrients, your brain and breathing. Breath is life. Without breath, there is no life. So it's very, very important to learn um, this breathing technique. Just practice it. Practice it. Please make yourself just, just um, you know, uh, make, a, make an effort with yourself to just do this simple breathing technique. I guarantee sometimes it's the simplest things that just make the biggest difference. It'll make a huge difference. Here's another technique I want to share with you, something I used to share with my clients who used to have anxiety when I used to help them, 333 technique. So what is it? Um, when you're stressed and you just want to get your mind off something that's building up to a feeling, notice just in that moment, in that moment, right then and there, notice three things you can see, three things you can hear, three things you can feel. 
That's it. It doesn't take long, but what it does is it breaks a chain of thought that can lead to those type of feelings. We, remember earlier I said emotion is energy in motion, which fuels behavior. That all starts with thought, a thought and thinking. If you start entertaining a train of thought, it's gonna eventually lead to feelings which will eventually fuel behavior or inactivity. Procrastination is another behavior. Doing nothing is doing something, right? So um, 333 will help you break a chain of thought that can lead to something you'd rather not do or it can lead to something you really wanna do. So three things I can see. And you just do it exactly from where you're sitting. You know, I can see a tree, I can see a car, I can see a baby. Uh, three things I can hear. I can hear a bird to the left up in that tree. I can hear a bus passing by. I can hear uh, a copier in the background. Like, you know, I'm just saying, for example. And three things you can feel. I can feel my shoes in my feet, my butt on this chair, and I can feel um, the collar around my neck from this shirt. You know, just keep focusing. And if you know, if it hasn't done the trick for you, just do it again. Just notice, see, hear, feel. Um, even extend it to smell, three things I can taste. Or it's about, you know what it really is doing at the end of the day? It's getting you really present. That's what it's doing. And really, many of us are not present. Really think about how often your mind is either in the past or in the future. Just have a think about that. Like it is pretty profound. Right now, where is your mind mostly? In that moment, it's, you know, we often are either contemplating the past, what we could have, should have done and whatever, or anticipating something in the future. And here's the interesting thing. Every moment in the past and the future was a moment of now. Now. It's just a bunch of now moments. And it's one way we can really lose, lose out on life. Life can just pass us by when we're in the past and the future. We never appreciate the moment. Getting in the moment is a very powerful thing that you can do for yourself, for your life, for, for everyone, really. So um, very powerful. Also, just taking a break, you know, like I've mentioned already, go outside, you know, um, just walking around the block, you know, when if something's happened at work and you're a bit stressed or something like that, you know, it can really make a big difference, you know. Also, just listening to some beautiful music, classical music, something, you know, listen to. I mean, now we've really got no excuse. We've got smartphones. We've got devices that really can give us things instantly. I mean, imagine 20 years ago what people did to get entertained or break habits. You know, now we've really got no excuses. You know, you can go and sit outside. You can YouTube. You can write into YouTube rainforest sounds, the sounds of the jungle water running, the sounds of the ocean. Like you can put, pull up on your phone instantly any sound or music that you know when you listen to that, you feel good. You know what they are. And it's just a matter of having a think about that. Get creative. Um, listen to something that can really calm you down. Music is a type of medicine that I honestly think some medications can't do. Um, but music, really, it's food for the soul. Um, or you can watch something inspirational. You know what I mean? There are some really cool YouTube uh, clips. Um, if you type in inspirational video, like people who really achieved something, people who had a certain mindset of success, you know, like get curious, follow some people that you look up to, you know, listen to interviews with people you really respect or look up to, whether that's Donald Trump or the Dalai Lama or whoever, you know what I mean? Like type in anyone's name and then interview. And I'm sure that person um, will be on YouTube. It's a great thing to watch. Or learn meditation. You know, I've been meditating for half my life pretty much every day. And really, it's it's an amazing technology. It's a technique, you know. It's not linked to any kind of, um, you know, philosophy. Uh, meditation is a vehicle. It's a vehicle that can go wherever you choose, just like a Holden Commodore or a Ford Falcon is a vehicle. There are different vehicles to get to a destination. Now, most human beings want a destination of fulfillment, joy, um, you know, contentment, happiness. We are all trying to use vehicles to get there. <laughs> Some of us use the vehicle of a career. Some of us use vehicle of money. Some of us use the vehicle of family, of children. You know what? There is one vehicle that you can use, which is meditation and going within. I don't think it's a uh, coincidence that a lot of the ancient masters on the planet said to us to go within, to go inside. All those things I just mentioned, hey, all good. Hey, I want career, family, money and all that. But they are transient. 
You know, sometimes we wonder why happiness doesn't stick around when we invest most of our happiness in things that don't last. We want lasting happiness, but we invest our time, money, and effort into things that don't last to get us that happiness. But meditation is a way of going within and really, really fostering that from inside, you know, very basic stuff. And look, I'm a big advocate of it. So right now, I just want to share with you three very simple um, meditative techniques that you can do. Meditation for beginners here, right here and now, meditation 101. The first one I want to share with you is a candle process. Very, very easy. Light a candle about a meter away from you and just stare at the flame, the brightest part right here. If you can see the arrow there, just at the very brightest part of the flame, there is something hypnotic and relaxing about fire, about staring at a flame. And I'm sure you can agree if you've ever gone camping or anything like that. How easy it is it for everyone to just huddle around the campfire and just lose themselves in it? And, you know, you're talking to one another, but you're not looking at them. You're just staring at the flame. There is something really relaxing about it. Light a candle, stare at the flame, and then if you want, five seconds in, five seconds out, the breathing that I just shared with you earlier, do that while staring at the flame. Um, and, you know, the flame acts as a visual anchor. The moment your mind starts to wander is the moment you can bring it straight back to attention to that flame. Really powerful. It's actually the way I started my meditation practice years ago. And you know what? I still use it to this day. It's very powerful. Very, very powerful. So please try. Try that. Very, very easy to do. If you're having problems sleeping at night, maybe put the uh, uh, tea candle near your bedside and with your head on the pillow, lying sideways, stare at the flame. And then when you feel like you're nodding off, one breath, poof, and just blow it out and go to sleep. Um, yeah, unless you want to leave the flame burning all night, maybe not a great idea, but, you know, up to you. <laughs> the next process I want to um, uh, share with you is a heart-centered breath heart-centered um, breathing. Now, this is very powerful because um, the heart, we're starting to understand, I follow a type of science, it's from the Heart Math Institute. If you were to Google that, the Heart Math Institute, you'll see some amazing science that they're doing focused around the heart. We've come to realize now that the heart is more than just a pump to pump blood around your body. It's actually like a little brain because you may not know that the heart actually has 40,000 sensory neurons, neurotransmitters, and it has um, support cells and proteins just like the cranial brain, just like the, the real brain um, in our head. So it actually qualifies as a mini brain. It's amazing. The heart actually emits an electromagnetic field as well. And this electromagnetic field that our heart emits can actually be detected by certain apparatus several feet away. And other human beings can actually sense that, whether they realize it or not, maybe even on an unconscious level. It's very powerful science. It might sound like woo-woo, but woo-woo is only science we don't understand yet. And we're now understanding more and more about the heart. Did you know the heart actually sends more information to the brain than the brain sends to the heart? So, I mean, what what's this means is that anytime you can get your heart in a coherent rhythm, it actually helps the brain make better decisions. It fosters creativity, um, problem solving. So that's why when we calm our hearts down, we're actually doing so much more to the body and the brain than just calming down. It has an amazing effect. The electromagnetic frequency of the heart can be um, uh, influenced just by heart-centered breath. And here's a very simple way to do that. You simply sit down nice and comfortably, close your eyes, focus on your heart space and breathe into it. Uh, once again, maybe that five seconds in, five seconds out. Visualize your heart expanding as you breathe in, contracting as you breathe out. Expanding on the in-breath, contracting on the out-breath. Expanding on the in-breath, just nice, slow, deep breath and your heart expanding and contracting. And then you bring to mind a time when you felt love, gratitude, appreciation, a really beautiful, positive feeling, maybe a beautiful moment, a time you were being recognized, a time you were overseas, a time you were in the arms of someone you loved. Just bring back that thought, that moment as if you're in the moment right now and connected to this heart-centered breath. That actually puts your heart into a coherent heart rhythm and it actually is hugely beneficial for your digestive system, your immune system, your um, central nervous system, 
It does amazing things. But if you want to know more about that, go to the Heart Math Institute. Just Google Heart Math Institute. There is an abundance of free information on that site that will do wonders for you, especially when quitting. Here's another technique too. I call it the honeypot process. It's a visualization technique. And I'm really into big, I'm really into visualization processes because Research has shown that your brain doesn't know the difference between something you're visualizing and something your body is physically actually doing. They've done amazing research with athletes, bodybuilders. They hooked up their body while they were physically doing their run or their bench press or whatever. And then they sat in a chair. They hooked the body and the brain up to the same people while they were visualizing themselves running, doing their bench press. And the apparatus the machinery detecting muscle movement, brain activity was all exactly the same. It's amazing, uh, really is. So I'm really big on visualization. So the honeypot process, you just sit down nice and comfortably and just imagine a pot of honey right above your head and it's full, just like this one here. And imagine it's slowly tipping and it slowly oozes out. It hits the center of the top of your head and it slowly starts to go over your head. What you're imagining is that this honey is a very special type of relaxation honey, the most relaxing honey you could ever find. And it's actually very special because it, it relaxes your skin, your muscles, nerves, tissue, organs, even your bones. And imagine it just slowly going over your ears, your face, down your neck, over your arms, down your shoulders and to the tips of your fingers, down your upper back, your chest, abdomen, lower abdomen, lower back, over your hips, down to your knees, down into your calves, shins, ankles, feet, and all the way to your tips of your toes. And just imagine that happening really slowly. I mean, that only takes maybe a few minutes. And while you're doing the breath as well, you know, get creative, just incorporate all of these. If you, there's no reason you couldn't incorporate the candle process, heart-centered breath, and this pot technique as well, you know? Why not? So they're, they're, I've gone through those four ways to help you quit. Now, I, I've got no doubt. I'm really hoping that at this point um, you've um, gained some good information and some insights that I know is really going to help you stop smoking, um, no matter what it is you try. But I, I really want you to stay with me now because I want to share with you a new way to stop smoking, something different, maybe something you haven't tried before. So a new way to stop smoking, I want to share with you my program. And if I've shared um, anything interesting to you, and if you think I know a thing or two about quitting, which I do, you know, I'd love you to um, to um, have a listen uh, and I'm, I'm going to share with you exactly what's keeping you smoking and what can um, uh, help you quit. So in terms of my, the way I've worked with people, I've seen about 1,600 smokers in the last eight years. So I've seen a lot of people and I've got a 96 percent success rate. So what does that mean? It means that 96% of the people I've seen in that first 30 to 60 days in my follow-up are not smoking. And I call that a success because if you go three weeks, as we've determined, um, smoking, you probably by now realize it's more of a habit than a drug addiction. They say it takes three weeks to break a habit. I know that if you've gone three weeks, if you've ever gone three weeks or longer, I know that when you start, if you've picked up smoking after that period of time, it was more of a decision than a craving. You can probably, if you're honest with yourself, um, you probably recognize that at that point, if you started after three weeks, it was a moment where you probably could have gone without a smoke, but you decided to have one anyway. And that's no fault of the aid. That's just a decision that you probably shouldn't have made. But I help people. I follow up with people long term as well. And I give them tools and techniques. I'm going to share with you now what those are to make sure that my clients quit long term. Some people out there are, are proposing, are boasting a success rate, but they have no way of tracking it. I did, um, I've tracked all of my clients and in that period of time are not smoking. So this program um, that I do, it's got no, there's no patches, no pills, no gums, no dangerous drugs or chemicals, needles, nothing at all. It's very much a tailor-made one-on-one program. No group sessions. You know, um, I do see groups, but the actual process is one-on-one -on -one, where I share some information in the group at the start, um, but um, the actual process is very much um, a one on one, you and me, uh, because uh, I want to minimize people's um, uh, distractions and, it, and it, it's very important attention is on me during the process. So, 
Well, I basically address the psychology of smoking in this program, the way I help people. We address your specific reasons for quitting, you know, because everyone's different. How is it that you can explain that two smokers are trying the exact same method to quit, whether it's patch, pill, gum or whatever? One person quits and the other doesn't. One person goes off saying, oh, how amazing it was and awesome and, oh, you've got to try this, it was great. And the other person goes, that was a waste of time, don't bother. But they tried the same thing. What that shows is that the variable in the equation in quitting is you, the individual, what's going on in your mind, in your life, your beliefs, what you've tried in the past, what you think's holding you back, you know, all that kind of thing. And so my program is very much about working on you, the individual. That's why it's so successful. You know, I really take the person into account. So what's this program's secret weapon? It's basically hypnosis, hypnotherapy. Now, one of two things, now that you've seen this, you've either tried it in the past or you've never tried it at all. Now, if you have tried it in the past, oh, I did hypnosis. Now, once again, one of two things. Either you really did notice a difference in how you felt the moment you opened your eyes, which if you went to see someone who knows their craft very well, that's exactly what you should have noticed. And maybe you went a little while, but, you know, stress, alcohol, something happened or on holiday and just, oh, I'll have a puff, you know, or you walked out, made no difference at all. But um, if that did happen to you, please don't write off hypnosis. Don't, as, as I'm doing here, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's a fake baby. Relax. It's not real. <laughs> That's me. And there's a little tub there because, look, here's the thing. Hypnosis is powerful, but not all hypnotherapists are. I want to repeat that. Hypnosis is powerful, but not all hypnotherapists are. That's what I mean by don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because you might have tried a certain kind of therapeutic modality and it might not have given you the success, it doesn't mean that the modality itself is pointless. It's just like, you know, if I go to a physio and I've got a sore back or a chiro and I go in for a few sessions and I've still got a sore back and, um, you know, then I wouldn't say chiropractic medicine is useless. Physiotherapy is a waste of time. You know, it's like if I've got anxiety or depression, I go see a psychologist. I wouldn't then, and I'm still anxious or depressed six months later, I wouldn't say psychotherapy is useless. You know, there's a lot of other things going on. You know, maybe you weren't really ready yet. You weren't really committed. Maybe there's always a reason, you know. Um, but there's got to be something to it because did you know that all of these Hollywood stars have quit using hypnosis? Ben Affleck, Matt Damon. Well, they're buddies, so one probably recommended the other. Ellen DeGeneres, Lindsay Lohan, Kevin Costner. So all of these stars have quit using hypnotherapy and I've seen a bunch of clients in the last eight years. So, you know, if I wasn't getting people success, then I wouldn't be getting all the referrals that I currently get. You know what I mean? When you get someone the result they want, they'll naturally speak to people. Once you've quit, what's the normal question people are going to ask? Wow, how did you quit? Oh, I quit with Nick, you know, kind of thing. Happens a lot, you know. So I'm really invested and I really make sure that all my clients get the value and get the result they want because then no one's happy. But here's the thing. I understand that a lot of weird things come to mind for people when they hear the word hypnosis. What usually comes to mind? Well, it's usually stuff like this, right? RSL shows, right? RSL clubs, you know, things you might have gone to see, you know, the, on the at the movies and in Hollywood and that kind of thing. But let me put this baby to rest right now. What you see on a stage, I'm going to give you some inside information, the inside track. I'm going to give you some secrets here. Um, I mean, the only thing that this kind of thing has in common with hypnotherapy is that it will never get you to do something you don't already want to do, whether that's act silly on stage like these guys or quit smoking, right? So let me put it into perspective here, right? Every time you go to an RSL club to watch a hypnotist, uh, hypnotist show, you know what's going to come. You know you're going to that show expecting to have a laugh. You know you're going to watch people doing silly stuff on stage, right? So 
When the guy asks for volunteers, shy people are not going to go anywhere near that stage. I can guarantee you that if you knew any every one of these people on stage, they are probably extroverts. They probably love being the centre of attention, you know. These people on stage are probably the kind of people doing exactly the kind of things after a few drinks in front of their mates at a barbecue or whatever. Everyone who knows these people on stage who are in the crowd are probably going, oh, my God, that's so Bill. Oh, Janice, yeah, she's like, oh, my God, she's such an out there person. To you who knows that person on stage, it's no surprise. But to the, to the, um, to the strangers in the crowd, they're going to be laughing their head off at these people, right? So, and here's the thing. So the guy asks for volunteers, right? So shy people are not going to go anywhere near that stage. Out of a, out of a room of, say, 200 people, maybe 20 people, you know, to have this many people on stage, he's probably doing this show in front of, well, I'd say, at least 200 people, at least, maybe more. So when people volunteer, here's the interesting thing too. Not all of them automatically become part of the show. The hypnotist is very good at reading body language. What he's asking himself is, who out of this crowd of people who want to be part of the show are gonna go with the flow, are real extroverts, are gonna you know, go along with some harmless suggestions? I can bet that he culled a few people here, as they always do, because he's wanting to weed out the people who are a little bit resistant and people who are wanting to sabotage the show as well. You'll always get some smart Alex who'll go, oh, watch me, I'm going to go up there and not do anything. I'm going to make him look like an idiot. Guess what happens to those people? Oh, thanks, mate. We don't need you. You can go back to your seat. <laughs> if the hypnotist is really good, they'll, he'll pinpoint those, those people immediately, right? But here's the thing, you see, words coming out of someone's mouth can never get your body and muscles to do something you do not want to do, right? I mean, you know, you're in charge of your muscles. You're in charge of what you do. So if you're sitting on a stage and some guy's asking you to act or behave in a way that goes against your values, it's not something you would do. You're not all of a sudden going to open your eyes and find your body doing it because you're in charge of what your body does. You know, I mean, imagine if hypnosis had that kind of power to get people to do stuff they wouldn't want to do. A lot of people wouldn't be doing hypnosis. Hypnotherapists would probably be in Canberra at all the banks, you know, running the world. You know, give me all your money. You won't remember anything <laughs> kind of thing. Right. Of course not. Right. So you're in control, you know. Um, so. I mean, you know, let's start with what hypnosis isn't. Look, the fact is a lot of people get this kind of imagery when they hear the word hypnosis, like it's some sort of voodoo mind control, that swinging watch or that, oh, you know, you know, taking advantage of people or stuff like that. I mean, really, it's not mind control at all. Here's the interesting thing. A hypnotherapist is not doing anything to you. A hypnotherapist simply guides your attention, you know, um, when someone comes to see me for a session, I'm not doing anything to them. I'm simply guiding them in a relaxed state and I'm guiding their attention. But you're the one who decides whether you're going to go with the flow or visualize or go with those suggestions. You're the one that has the final say. So in a sense, you could say that all hypnosis is self-hypnosis to a degree because you're doing it to yourself through the guidance of someone else. And when you go along with that guidance, then you experience the benefit of what's on the other side of a session. It's no different to going to a yoga um, session and sitting on the back of the room, sitting in a chair, watching a yoga instructor do their positions and expecting you to get the benefit. <laughs> right? Of course, that's not going to happen. You only get the benefit of a yoga class when you follow along with what the yoga instructor is doing. Not so different to a hypnosis session. You're only going to get the, um, the uh, benefit by following along with what's being said, you know, so you kind of do it to yourself, you know, in that sense, you know. So, you know, your muscles do what you um, tell them to do, obviously, you know, that you don't get stuck in hypnosis. Some people think they fall asleep, wake up and not remember anything. No, you don't fall asleep at all. When you fall asleep, you're actually unconscious. So how can your unconscious, I mean, there's no way of me being able to communicate with your unconscious. If, if I had a client that falls asleep, you're very much aware in the room. It feels like a very normal, natural state, a state that you actually experience 
quite often through the day. At any moment, people could open their eyes, get up and walk out, you know? Like there's nothing, um, it, it, it's not like, um, you know, relaxation is experienced in different ways by different people. You don't necessarily feel hypnotized, so to speak, quote, unquote. All it feels like is a very, very relaxing, um, it almost feels like a fluffy guided meditation from where the client is sitting, you know, but, even though it feels like not much might be going on on the surface, deep down, there's a lot going on. When you understand exactly what hypnosis is, what it's doing, why it works and what it's working with, then it's it can be amazing. Like the difference you can feel is amazing. And I'm going to share with you in a little bit. So you know what I share for people who think they can't be hypnotized? I actually say it's a very normal, natural state that you experience like when you're driving. When you're driving a long way on a freeway and then all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, where am I going? 20 minutes in the wrong direction, I should have turned off. We call it something different, but it's actually a hypnotic state. What you say though, you don't say, oh, sorry, I was in a hypnotic trance. You say, I was in the zone, I zoned out, I tuned out, I was a million miles away, lights are on, no one's home. These are all states that we naturally experience through the day, which is actually a hypnotic state. Another example when we experience that is when we're watching TV. The TV is the most powerful hypnotic tool on the planet. You know, we zone out, we zo we're zombies in front of the TV, you know, really. And that's why ads during certain shows are very strategically placed because advertisers know this stuff about um, influence, the unconscious, the subconscious and influencing that. It's no... Um, it's no accident at all that when you're watching a show, the ads will be related to what you're watching. So if you're watching MasterChef, oh, lo and behold, Coles and Woolies and oh, pots and pans are for sale and oh, Harvey Norman's um, special on, um, you know, mixes and whatever, you know, I mean, that's, that's done for a reason because we're naturally in a suggestibility state when we're watching TV. We're in a very relaxed, wakeful state. And you know what? It's even subtle, more subtle than that. One time I remember, I'll never forget this because this is how subtle that we can be influenced um, when we're in front of a TV. I was watching Casino Royale, that James Bond movie that I'm, you know, you've probably heard of. It was on TV. One of the ads I recall being shown during that movie was for cat food. Now, you wouldn't think, oh, cat food and James, how is that related? The cat food is called Royale Cat Food. Interesting, hey? And like, I was watching it with my wife. I turned to her and I said, oh, notice that? And she was like, what, what? You know, I'm like, that cat food, it's called Royale cat food. What are we watching? Casino Royale. Like, it's really subtle. Now, most people wouldn't even pick up on that. But because you're in a suggestibility state, you're getting that kind of message. Your unconscious is picking that up as well as your conscious, maybe, you know, while you're watching the ad. And then lo and behold, you need to buy cat food. And then, oh, Royale cat food. The next time you're in Coles and Woolies, what do you end up buying? Crap. But you will never relate that and connect that to what you watched a week ago or a few days ago. You know what I mean? Very, very subtle. And also when you're reading a book, I mean, that's another time when you're naturally in a hypnotic state. The hypnotic state is nothing other than your ten attention being drawn and you're focused in such a way that another part of you naturally joins um the joins the table kind of thing. Like when you're driving along, you know, you'll get to your end destination. You don't even realize how you got there, but you just kind of got there. But both parts of you are there at the same time, your conscious and your unconscious mind. Because when you're driving along, if someone were to step out in front of you while you're in that state, you don't just boop, 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 <laughs> run them over. You snap out of it and you're like, oh, what? so it's like, you're always on guard. You can always react if you really need to, but it's that autopilot part of you that can take over when you're in that nice relaxed state. Autopilot, unconscious mind, two words for the same thing, right? I'll get into that in a little bit. So, you know, that's what that's where that watch um, thing came into. It's like, you know, you could use anything. You could use a pen. You could use anything to get someone to, but, you know, pocket watches were just something that they could easily swing back then. So when your focus is on something, then you drift into this state, you know, that's where that kind of thing came from. But 
Look, let me share with you a little bit more about what's actually going on so you understand more about your unconscious mind and how it works and why hypnosis can be a really effective tool for you to stop smoking. Sure, you can stop smoking with the information I've given you already, and I'm sure some of you will watching this, but there is a way to make it feel so much easier. This is an aid at the end of the day. What is an aid? It's aiding your commitment. So, and it's supposed to make it feel a lot easier. I have no doubt, simply because I've seen so many people over so many years, that hypnosis can make it feel so much easier for you. But you can obviously quit without it and with the tools I've given you. But I want to give you an understanding of hypnosis. That way, at least you know what it's about and you're informed. So if you ever do wanna use it in the future, you know exactly what it is and how it works. So to give you more of a bit of the science behind what it is, here's a, a simple graph that shows you um, the four distinct brainwave frequencies that we have, right? So right now we're in the beta state, the top one, right? So it's, um, you know, you, we're awake, we're, you know, it's that normal alertness, consciousness, you know, very alert, very aware. Then there's the alpha state. Anytime you're in a relaxed, calm, lucid, not really thinking too much, you're zoning out, you're in that alpha brainwave state, right? That is the state that we mostly use in a hypnosis process and a hypnotic process. However, some people can really go even a little deeper. Maybe if I see people who practice meditation or that kind of thing, they may get to the theta state. The theta brainwave state, this is what these squiggly lines would look like on a machine if you hooked yourself up and you were in these states. In the theta state, it's a deep relaxation, like a deep meditation and in these places where, you know, you can get mental imagery and that kind of thing. But really the alpha state, is the is is only what's needed and then there's the delta state when you are asleep at night you're unconscious basically right now what i tell to people who think they can't experience a hypnotic state i tell them i know for a fact that there are at least two times in the day that you do experience a hypnotic state just before you fall asleep at night just before you wake up in the morning how do i know that because when we go to sleep, we go through these stages naturally. You're in that half awake, half asleep state. So when you fall asleep at night, you're literally moving from beta down to delta. So obviously there's a moment, it might only be for a few seconds or a few minutes, but you naturally go through the alpha and the theta state, you know. Then when you're asleep at night, you spend time in the delta state. And then when you wake up in the morning, you come back out of that state. So when you you've woken up but you haven't opened your eyes yet you're in that theta alpha state this here's another really powerful tip for you is to really that is the time to do all your visualizing state your affirmations i am well i am wellness things happen for me easily and effortlessly i'm the creator of my future i'm grateful for all i have like i any affirmation or visualizing you want to do, you want to do it just before you fall asleep, first thing in the morning, because you're naturally in touch with your unconscious mind. Any affirming or visualizing you can do, you can bet that you're mingling with and you're interacting with your unconscious mind when you do it in those moments. So very powerful. The only people I say that can't be hypnotized are those who... Um, have an intellectual disability, severe ADHD, autism, um, uh, below average IQ, people who cannot follow verbal instructions. Because to go into the alpha or theta state, you need to follow in a hypnosis process, you follow the verbal instructions of the therapist. So if you're unable to follow those instructions, obviously you can't be led into a relaxed state. Also, obviously people who don't understand English. I mean, you know, I have had people call saying, oh, this is for my brother, it's for my aunt, it's for a friend, they speak X language, you know, would this work for them? I can't, well, no, obviously not because it's a linguistic process. You need to follow along with instructions. Other people that can't be hypnotized are those who are so reluctant to let go of the misconceptions that they can't be hypnotized. They'll cross their arms going, come on, hypnotize me. Hypnotize. You can't, you can't, I can't be hypnotized because they've got some misconceptions that they think it's for weak-minded people or that it's for some, it's some voodoo mind control.
It's actually the opposite. It's not for weak-minded people because you need to very much focus on what's being said and you need to follow along. So if you're weak-minded, you might not be able to do that. So quite the opposite. But let's go into even a little more detail here about conscious and unconscious mind and how and why the hypnosis can make you feel so different around the urge to smoke. So to the left, <coughs> excuse me, we've got the normal state, normal, you know, like the state we're both in at the moment. So there's conscious and unconscious mind. And to the right, the hypnotic state. And we've got a critical faculty. It's a basically a barrier that separates the conscious from the unconscious. Now, they're not completely separated. They are obviously always intermingled and, um, and um, connected, but they're generally pretty separated by this faculty, um, this, this um, barrier, right? So to explain the aspect of the conscious mind, right? What is the conscious mind, right? So, well, they say it's only two to 4% of who we are, what we do in our automatic behaviors. Very, very little, two to 4%. That's not much at all. As much as we like to think it's our conscious mind that's running the show, it really isn't because look, we all know what we should and shouldn't be doing, right? If our conscious mind was the only thing really responsible for human behavior and change and fulfillment, we'd all be perfect, right? <laughs> of course, we'd all be perfect human beings. We know what we shouldn't be doing. We know we shouldn't be smoking, but there's a part of us that just draws us to there for some reason, right? So we know it's not um, just a conscious thing. I mean, smoking is illogical. It makes no sense. Sometimes people say to me, I got no reason why I should be smoking. I just feel like I should be doing it. So then doesn't it make sense that we need to incorporate a part of your mind that is beyond conscious logic? Obviously, that's just makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if smoking isn't consciously being controlled, well, we need to employ another part of you that seems to want to pull you down this road. And we'll I'll touch on more of that in a minute. The conscious mind is what we're in right now. It's what you're, it's that frontal lobe, decision-making, how to get from A to B in your car. It's, it tracks time as well. You know, if you right now, I had a, um, a, you know, I asked you how long has it been since the start of this um, um, presentation, you'd probably get pretty close because there's, you're in that conscious state, which pretty much tracks time. It lives in time. Now, um, like we like I've said already, we need to employ another part of your 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 psyche uh, heat. We want to leverage a deeper, more powerful part of you to let go of smoking quickly, easily, and immediately. And the unconscious mind is what is used in a hypnosis process. So what's the unconscious mind? The unconscious mind has basically two main functions in your life. One is to make your life easier, and the other is protection physical and emotional. Now, it makes your life easier by driving your automatic pilot. Everything you do in a day that you no longer have, a, have to give a moment's thought to is being taken care of by something. What's that something? It's your automatic pilot. It's your unconscious mind. So uh, driving, perfect example. You know, when you first learned to drive, you had to think about everything, blinker, brake, indicator, look over the shoulder, clutch, gear, all that stuff, right? But through time and repetition, a habit got formed. And then what happened? It literally moved from your conscious mind, a program was created and it got filed in your unconscious. And that driving program gets triggered, maybe the moment you unlock your car, the moment you put the key in the door, the moment you unlock it, the moment your bum hits the driver's seat. There's a particular moment you're not aware of that is a trigger moment that draws to the draws up the file of driving a car and you just drive a car. But that file, that program had to be created, right? And we run our lives like that. The unconscious mind is a filing process. It's a library of programs that the conscious mind, the two to 4%, you can consider that like really expensive real estate. The conscious mind only has stuff up there that's really relevant for the here and now that needs to be focused on. Anything that doesn't really need to be there, that, that habit and automatic pilot can take over, just gets filed to the unconscious mind and brought up when it needs to be, right? So makes your life easier. The other function of your unconscious mind is protection, physical and emotional. So physically, if you touched a hot stove, you accidentally hit your finger with a hammer, a ball comes flying to your face, you have instant unconscious automatic reactions, right? You don't have to think about it because your unconscious mind is there to protect your body in this world. If we didn't have that faculty there, we'd probably be dead by now. We wouldn't have certain reactions. We wouldn't have that sort of 
um, that, that feeling to stay safe in the world, that reaction, right? So you don't have to think about that. It happens automatically, right? But it also has an emotional protection element. Here's the real interesting thing, right, about smoking. When you first started to smoke, maybe as a teenager, when you had your very first few puffs of a cigarette, chances are on a conscious level, it was a pretty horrible um, experience, right? Like, ah, this is crap, ah, cough, cough, yeah, it stinks, it's burning my nose, my finger, blah, 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 tastes disgusting. But on a deeper emotional unconscious level, you were saying ex exactly the opposite. Look at me, aren't I cool? I'm tough, I'm a rebel, I look older, I'm part of the crowd, I'm, part, I'm one of the boys, I'm one of the girls, all that kind of stuff, right? So here's the interesting thing. In that moment, your unconscious mind came across a new, what they call an SEE, a significant emotional event. And it had one very simple, quick decision to make. And it's doing this all the time, particularly in our early years. It had to ask itself, is this good or bad? Yes or no? Should I keep this up or not? Well, I'm getting all these good emotional feelings. This smoking thing must be a good thing. So click, it made that connection and it's hung on to it for the rest of your life until you can get it listening to a new story right? So here's the thing. You actually tricked your unconscious mind into thinking that smoking was a good protective thing for you. Because your unconscious mind seeks protection and safety all the time. So anytime it perceives something as enhancing protection and safety, it's going to make a positive connection to it because it's there to serve you. So when we're teenagers, affiliating, being part of a crowd and a peer group is really important, right? It's almost like a herd mentality. Anything that puts us out of the herd, you know, just like in Africa, we're vulnerable to attack, right? We've got eyes on us. Oh, that's not good. That's unsafe. That's not, that's not a good feeling. So anything that makes us part of the group, safety in numbers, your unconscious mind is going to interpret as a safe, good thing. So that's the connection that it made with cigarettes back then. And it's going to hang on to that until you get it listening to a new story. It's there for emotional comfort and support. It wants that for you. Maybe that's why when smokers have an emotional moment, once they quit maybe, or maybe even when they're smoking, they go back to cigarettes because deep down on an unconscious level, there's a safety net. There's a, yes, come here. Yes, this is protective part of the crowd. Yeah, that kind of thing, you know. So what do we do in hypnosis? All we do is we fade away that critical faculty. What we do is we guide you into a very relaxed state where both here on the right, the hypnotic state, the conscious and unconscious are both present at the same time. You don't know the moment your unconscious becomes present, but it just does. Just like you don't know the moment you zone out while you're driving. You don't know the moment you zone out when you're watching TV. You don't know the moment you zone out when you're reading a book. Similar thing. When you're in a hypnotic state, I take my time to guide people in a very deep, relaxed state. And the unconscious naturally becomes present, just like in that um, in the, the hypnotic state, in that circle, in that uh, ball to the right. Here's another really interesting way to put it, right? So... Imagine that it's like you're conscious and unconscious because when it, when someone has decided to stop smoking, it's like there's an internal tug of war going on. Isn't that right? Can't you relate? Where it's like part of you, let's say your conscious mind, wants to stop smoking. You know it's bad for you. It's costing you money. It's killing you. It's making you stink and antisocial. But the fact that there's this urge going on, pulling you in another direction, let's say it's your unconscious mind here, like this guy, it's like it's pulling you in another direction. However, think about this logically. There's no part of your mind, conscious or otherwise, that wants you dead, right? <laughs> There's no part of your mind that wants you dead. There's no, your unconscious mind wouldn't be pulling you down a path to do an action or behavior that it knows it could lead to your physical death on this planet, right? So, if it's pulling you down that path, it's only because it thinks there's something positive for you down there, whether it's having a smoke, eating a burger or chocolate or drinking or taking drugs or gambling or whatever it is. It's only pulling you down that road because it wants you to get to some end game, some end state of being, of maybe relaxation, comfort, support, something like that. The similar things you experienced when you might have started smoking way back then, those emotional things, right? 
So when the unconscious mind, when this guy here on the right gets the new message, what we're basically saying to that part in a hypnosis process, we want to bring in alignment. We want to talk to that part through the conscious mind. We want to say to this part, thanks for wanting protection and comfort and all that good stuff for me. Thanks, unconscious mind. Still want you to do that. But it's not down that part. It's not on that side of the rope. It's on the other side. When it gets that new message, it's like a light bulb moment, right? It's like, wow, okay, not smoking is going to make me healthy, breathe easier, live longer and be protected, right? So when that light bulb goes off, it lets go of that side of the rope. It instantly gets, gets cut and it joins the conscious mind. It lets go of that rope and it joins the conscious mind in an alignment. Where there is alignment, it's easier to move forward. Just like when you um, get an alignment on your car, your two front wheels, if they were pointing outwards in a V, isn't it going to be a struggle, resistance to move forward? But when you get your two wheels pointing in the right direction together, it's easy to move forward. There's no resistance. It's easier, right? That's what all of my clients feel when they open their eyes and they're looking around and they're thinking, they're trying to look for that urge after they've spent, you know, a good period of time in a room with me. Usually, you know, you think about it, if you were in a meeting for a while, an hour, hour and a half, two hours, and what would be the first thing you'd want to do when you walk outside, right? Spark up, right? <laughs> but after my sessions, I say to someone right now, you're about to walk outside and go into your car there. Do you feel like a smoke? Do you really need to rush out? And they're like, actually, oh, oh. what they're feeling is alignment. Their unconscious and conscious has now come together in an alignment process. And that will stay there until if you take a puff, drag or draw, it just comes crashing down. The, any alignment that is created in a hypnotic process will just come falling apart with one puff. And I'm sure you've been there and I know you can relate. You might have quit for a while. You got complacent. Maybe we're having a few drinks, stressed and thought, oh, I can have one. One won't hurt. It's my birthday. I haven't seen Billy in years, you know. One won't hurt and it's just one puff and it's over. You've got to treat this like a recovering alcoholic. The, don't let your feeling of control in the future trick you into making you think you can get away with a puff because that feeling of control that gets created with hypnotherapy will immediately, will, it will just start crumbling with one puff um, and you've probably experienced that before, right? Here's another way to look at it. Trying to quit with um, just cold turkey or replacement therapies is like sitting in a movie theatre, hating what you're watching and screaming at the screen, hoping your screams will change that horrible movie, <laughs> right? We know that's not going to happen because we know that what we're experiencing on that screen is not coming from the screen. It's coming from behind you in the real, in, that, in, the, in the projector room. So hypnosis is like going to the projector room changing the reels so you experience something different and there's something profound about that the reel the projector is your mind and in a hypnotic process we get you visualizing we use the power of visualization to create a new reel then when you open your eyes that feeling of control and confidence is like you watching a new movie the new movie of your non-smoking life right it's quite simple i'm sure by this point it seems really logical to you why hypnosis works and why it can make such a difference to you. And this is exactly why I didn't become a psychologist because I want to get people quick, fast results. I don't believe that healing has to take a long time. Sure, maybe in some cases, some people might believe that it really has to, but for something like this, I know it can be done quick if you have the right tools and the right technology. So, let me just go through my program, the Quit With Nick program. I just want to run you through this just to let you know what's involved if any, if you decided to work with me. What we do first is an initial phone assessment. I don't accept anyone into my program. I don't speak, I don't see anyone I haven't spoken to first because I want to get to know you, the individual, you as a person. My program is a holistic program and I like to take everything into account. I want to find out on an initial phone assessment before I decide to work with anyone, what's going on for you? What are your stresses? What's your work environment? What's your social environment? Are you around smokers? What could get you unstuck? What have you tried in the past? Why now? Why not before? Why not in the future? 
all that kind of thing. That happens on an initial foam assessment, and that can be anywhere from 20 to 30 to, I've spent 45 minutes, um, up to 45 minutes on the first point of call for people. But I know it's part of, it's an essential part of the process. Then if um, you are a good fit for the program, I send you some preparation. There's some reading material, some listening material. It's extremely important to prepare your mindset. Your success is directly related to how well you're prepared. I'm a huge advocate of that. That's why I send you some preparation material as well. Then we do the actual session. It's called a rapid change therapy session, basically, where I incorporate everything that I've learned over 15 years of study, research, seminars, courses. I've probably spent $150,000 on courses and, and books and research all about what makes us do what we do, what's what makes us change, the science of human behavior and success, basically. And I'm weaving all of that in. Everything that I am and everything that I've done is weaved into that session to make you feel different when you walk out. Then there's a follow-up process. So I'm in touch with all of my clients for at least 30 to 60 days after the session because I want to make sure that the, the um, confidence that people are feeling when they leave me is something that sticks around. I want to make sure that it's not something that lasts for just a few hours or a few weeks, but at least that point where I know a habit has been broken. You need to address the craving for a cigarette, then a habit needs to fade away. Habits can only fade away when a certain period of time has passed. Habit, because you've got memory, you remember doing stuff. So a habit isn't going to disappear in a moment, but the craving to do the action that is reinforcing the habit can disappear really quickly. So I've got a very close follow-up um, process and you get a bunch of support materials as well. Those support materials are MP3 hypnosis downloads. You can listen to directly on your phone. They're there for you anytime. My voice, same music that you hear in a session. And it's there to make sure that it's reinforced. The work that we do in the session can very easily be reinforced on your part by just listening to some MP3s. There's also some eBooks in there. There's oh, really, there's so many support materials. I can't even go through them all right now. But I will mention the ebook because let's face it, your mind is going through a transition when you make the change from smoker to non-smoker, but so is your body. So it needs to be supported as well. There's a bunch of things in there to support your body making the change. So the detox process happens faster, smoother, and doesn't affect you as much. They say the detox process lasts anywhere between three to seven days. So there's some simple things that you can do that I've given, I've written down in that ebook that you really should follow to make that first week, that first transition be a lot, lot smoother. And everyone gets a free backup session as well. It's included in my program. So essentially, people are purchasing two sessions, but the second session is only needed if you ever start smoking any time in the future. So, you know, it's a pretty comprehensive process, you know, like I was a smoker myself. I've got a science degree. I'm very left brain logical. So I like to really break down all the elements that I know can make a difference for someone's long term success. And I think I've covered them all very well in this program. So what's the investment what's the investment to breathe easier smell better look better feel better save money live longer take that control and freedom and increase your confidence and self-esteem quitting can give you all of this and i know you know it it's only 595 dollars. that's it and you know for most of my clients who are packet a day smokers, that's 30, that's about a month's worth of smoking i bet if you're smoking 20 a day or more you're spending that in a month anyway. So why not take the money you know you're already going to spend anyway and invest it into gaining all of that, really, all of that is worth that kind of, I mean, really, when it comes to the cost, it's just directly related to value. You know, sometimes people will say, oh, gee, that's a lot of money. It's like, well, compared to what, really? Like, People will blow that on a flat screen without even thinking about it. People will blow that on a nice night out on a meal and drinks, you know? I mean, really? Like, is that a lot of money compared to what? I mean, you know what I mean? It's the most preventable cause of death in the world. If someone really values quitting and what it can mean for their life and future, they'll pay anything, really. And I think that's a very reasonable price. But hey, look, I want to make it even easier for you. Anyone who mentions this presentation, anyone who gets in touch with me wants a session, 
mention this presentation, you'll get a $50 discount. So $50 off, you know, it's my way to encourage people too, you know. I mean, I don't want money to stand in the way of something like this, you know. I mean, so feel free to get in touch, um, you know, uh, and mention this presentation and I'll give you a, 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 that $50 discount. I've got locations across Sydney. I also do home visits as well. If it's difficult for you to get to me, I can come to you. Um, I do have group discounts as well. If people have other people they want to quit with, it's a beautiful thing to be able to quit and encourage and support each other. That is available. I also do Skype sessions for any clients who aren't in Sydney, they might be anywhere in Australia or even the world, mind you, anywhere in the world, I have got international clients as well that can be done via Skype as well. It's the beauty of this process as well. It can easily be done virtually via Skype. So if you want to get in touch with me, take advantage of this offer and you realise it's time to quit. And if you honestly think that this can make the quitting process feel a lot easier, Drop me an email, info at quitwithnick.com.au or have a look at my website, quitwithnick.com or quitwithnick.com.au. goes to the same website. Or you can give me a free call, um, toll free, uh, 1300 883 272. 1300 883 272. Look, I'd love to hear from you. I know um, I can help you quit. I've done it a long time. So thank you so much for listening to this presentation. I really hope you got something out of it. And please feel free to share this as well. Sharing is caring. You know, um, you never know whose life you might save simply by sharing this uh, presentation. It's going to be a YouTube video. So Please show your care and share with anyone who might be wanting to quit, thinking of quitting, or is in the process of quitting. I'm sure this could really help them. So take care um, to your health. Would love to hear from you and good luck on your journey. This is Nick from Quit With Nick.